Hi, my name is Jen Crawford, a fifth year grad student in the Sigmund group. And with me is Lori DeGaulle, a fourth year grad student in the Roberts group. Um, for the fourth video in short course module number two, which is a brief introduction to DFT or density functional theory. And I would like to note that this is really going to be a high level introduction to DFT. So I really won't cover any of the important theorems that have led to the development of this theory that explain really why this is a really powerful quantum mechanical method. Um, but if you're interested, there are a lot of books and a lot of resources that I'll collect in the references section that you can refer to yourself. So just at its very core, DFT relies on the relationship between electron density and electronic energy. And so in order to perform a DFT computation, you need to select a basis set and a functional. And so a basis set is basically a set of functions that describe the orbitals or the electrons of the system. And then the functional allows you to understand the electronic exchange and correlation that really accounts for how electrons might interact with each other. And so if you want to put this in the context of the Schrodinger equation, essentially your functional is that Hamiltonian and your basis set is approximating the wave function. And so with that, choosing a basis set and functional that works for your system is very, very important. So usually uh, what people will represent this as is a Jacob's Ladder, where um, you're moving from Hartree Hell within Hartree Fock theory, and then within DFT, you're then moving to more and more complicated functionals all the way to the heaven of chemical accuracy. And so many of the methods that we use in the Sigma group are at this level, and they're hybrid GGA and hyper meta GGA functionals, but I wouldn't worry too much about what that means. Um, just know that this is a real, these are really standard functionals to use within organic chemistry. I would like to note that dispersion can be very challenging to account for within DFT, and so there are a lot of strategies to do that, but it is something to be aware of if you think that dispersion is going to be important in your system. And I won't get into more details here about DFT, um, but there will be a separate video that describes this in more detail, so stay tuned for that. But then how do we use DFT for statistical modeling? So we begin with the geometry optimization. Generally, we use the functional B3LIP, um, followed by a single point at a higher level of theory, um, generally MO62X. Um, and then sort of an optional subsequent geometry optimization, um, which depends on the properties and the accuracy that's desired for the particular system that you're looking at. And so within the process of geometry optimization, um, this is how it sort of works. You have the, your guess of your initial structure that you got from molecular mechanics. And here you would submit um, a subset of the a subset or all of the conformers that you got from your conformational search. Um, this guess, um, the program which we use Gaussian, would compute the energy and gradients using um, that basis set and functional as its sort of starting point to compute that energy. Um, identify whether that optimization criteria is met. If it is not met, then the program uses gradients to propose a new lower energy geometry um, and then energy and gradients are computed for that geometry. But if the optimization criteria were met, um, then the geometry optimization will finish. And this should finish with no errors and no imaginary frequencies, which would indicate that it's not at a true minimum. And ideally, you will find the global quantum mechanical minimum by sampling the conformational space. But one thing I would like to note is sort of as we're moving in uh, upwards in theory, so from molecular mechanics, to a mid-level DFT theory, to a higher level DFT theory, um, really where our energies get more accurate. So we start from really inaccurate molecular mechanics geometries and then move to more accurate energies. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we get parameters from that lowest energy structure and that will also influence the, any Boltzmann averaged parameters that we take. 
And so again, going back to this sort of key question that we've been trying to answer through the course of this module is why do we need to sample conformational space and how do we really minimize computational cost? And one key goal of sampling conformational space is allowing us to sort of replicate the dynamics of the system. So we're able to take parameters from the minimum value, the Boltzmann averaged um, parameters, as well as any maximum values. And in order to get these values, we need to follow this general procedure. When we begin with a conformational search, followed by a geometry optimization, trying to get to that global minimum rather than just local minimum, and then calculating single points and potentially computing subsequent optimizations such that we can acquire parameters to develop statistical models. Um, Lori, do you have any questions? Uh, so you mentioned that you use hybrid GGA and hyper beta GGA DFT uh, commonly in the group. And I was wondering if you, uh, when you actually perform this, do you start off that way or do you go to a lower level of DFT or possibly uh, molecular mechanics prior to hybrid GGA or hyper meta GGA? Um, so actually the hybrid GGA functionals um, actually aren't so actually the hybrid GGA functionals aren't too costly to use and they, the geometry that they get you to is actually close to a geometry um, that you would get with MO6-2X, but at a much lower computational cost. Um, and so in general, we don't really need to start lower than B3LIP because you still need some measure of accuracy um, or else, you know, as you, you really do have to move up more in theory to get to accurate geometries. Um, so really B3LIP is sort of as low as we would want to go, but B3LIP as well is, um, it's pretty robust. It's pretty traditional within or computational organic chemistry. Um, and so it's a good starting point, um, but it's not as good as some of these other functionals, especially the Omega B97X2. Um, and there are other um, papers that you can look at in the references um, that really get into the weeds on the geometries that you get when optimizing using these different functionals. I was wondering then, uh, how do you know when to stop at, uh, let's say, MO6-2X versus Omega B97X? And how do you know specifically when um, B3LUP is fine to use? So a lot of this depends on previous benchmarking studies on similar molecules um, that we use in the Sigmund group. Um, and so a lot of times we won't do the benchmarking ourselves, but we'll look in the literature um, and have a good starting point and for uh, a, a basis set and functional combination to use. Uh, what's the difference between a single point and a geometry optimized structure? And secondly, uh, why would you need to confirm uh, specifically with a single point that you've found uh, the global minimum? So that's a really good question. So within um, geometry optimization, you're performing actually a number of single points because what a single point is, is it takes the geometry that you have and then computes the energy of those coordinates. Um, and so when we're confirming with a single point, um, really, the low energy structure that we find after the geometry optimization at that like lower level of theory might not actually be the true minimum. Um, so we really want to get a more we really want to use a more accurate method um, to really confirm the relative energies of those molecules. Um, and then I had another uh, question. Uh, this one's more of a definition question. Uh, so here in the graph that you show, what does PES stand for in PES scan? And then also, uh, what is the formal definition of an imaginary frequency and why do we um, need to know about them? Um, so that just stands for potential energy surface. Um, really what this is trying to show is um, that, you know, similar to what I've shown previously, is that you have areas of low energy space um, and areas of high energy space. And with DFT, you're really optimizing down to a minimum. You're not gonna cross these barriers. 
um, you're always going towards a minimum. So you might get stuck in a well. And so that's one reason why we do a conformational search because now we're sampling a number of different wells. So we're more likely um, to access that global minimum. And I was wondering what is an imaginary frequency and why do we need to know about them? So an imaginary frequency in a practical sense rather than a theoretical sense is when you look at the computed IR frequencies of a particular molecule, you see a negative value. Um, and so essentially when this indicates that you're not at a ground state and actually when you're doing transition state calculations, the presence of one imaginary frequency um, forming, breaking or making the bond that you're considering is actually evidence of a transition state. Um, this concludes um, this video in short course module number two, and the next section will really deal with the specifics on how to submit um, a job within the Gaussian program.